Now, uh, let's go straight to Tathra in New South Wales. The opposition leader, Bill Shorten, is speaking down there. Let's take a listen in. Uh, the implementation of more uh, panels uh, on roofs and community groups. So it's a range of measures which local communities can use. It's, it's seed funding, which will generate uh, common sense, small scale projects, which will allow community groups or perhaps renters, people living in social housing, who don't have the wherewithal to individually invest in renewable energy to get to that critical mass so they too can access cheaper energy and which is renewable. How well set up is the lodge to address climate change? You'll oh. be living in it later this year if today's opinion polls are correct. Now, oh. is, are there solar panels on the roof of the lodge? I have no idea. I have to say, um, uh, in terms of uh, the polls, and I just make this observation despite your compliment in it, I made a decision nearly six years ago not to analyse the polls, good, bad or indifferent. It's the policy I had uh, when Tony Abbott was Prime Minister. It's the policy I had when Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister. And nothing the current fellow's done is going to distract me from developing good policy. If you look after the policy, the politics looks after itself. Does Australia risk falling into recession under a Labor government? Oh. Listen, the government's just uh, talking more and more fear every day. Um, you know, I would say to Australians, get used to the fact that an increasingly desperate government with barely months left in their term of office are going to start trying. There are big issues in this country not being addressed. We have no meaningful climate change policy under the government that currently leads Australia. That's a risk. Uh, families, are, they're getting their kids ready to go back to school from tomorrow all around Australia. Cost of living pressures are a real risk to the Australian uh, householders. What's happening wherever you go in Australia, be it in the coast, in the bush, in the cities, everything is going up except your wages. The real risk in Australia at the moment is that the current government is managing the economy in the interests of vested, in the interests of the top end of town, and yet everyday households are having to dip into family savings to make ends meet. So the real risk in Australia at the moment is another term of coalition government. The single biggest risk, not even the inaction on climate change, which is shocking, not only the cuts to hospitals and schools, which is terrible, not only the fact that we've got a government who never seems to worry about cost of living pressures going up, the fact that everything's going up except wages, the single biggest risk is instability. Does anyone seriously think that the coalition doesn't view this current election as a distraction from getting on with the civil war in the Liberal Party and the National Party? Instability is driving Australians uh, around, around the you know, to the points of distraction. The most common sentiment I got this summer uh, when I was on the beach and elsewhere, is people just said, when will we have some stable government in this country? That's what I can promise Australians. Stability with a sensible plan. Does the government Well, I think uh, it's a description of the economy. I mean, I think when we look at the creation of jobs, uh, Australians deserve credit. Australian business deserves credit. Government deserves some credit. A lot of the jobs that have been created have been in the NDIS, for example. What we've got to realise in Australia is it's not that... Uh, we've got to get over the politics of just the blame game and get back to outlining proper vision and policy. Well, this country needs to work together a lot more than it currently does. We've got to, for instance, solve the energy crisis by investing in renewable energy. We've got to restore people's penalty rates so we can get wages moving again in this country. We've got to uh, improve the patient rebate uh, for Medicare so that people can get relief from cost of living pressures in healthcare. This country works best when middle and working class Australians are doing okay. At the moment, they're getting squeezed. Corporate profits are up six times wages. The problem is this economy is not working in the interests of everyday Australians and their families. All good? Prime Minister says oh. the boy in aluminium smelter will be forced to under a Labor government. Oh, listen, this... This government's only got the Tony Abbott playbook from 2013. Uh, remember the government, the, uh, the Liberals said that Wyala would shut, it's expanding. Uh, let's just call out the fear campaign of the government for what it is. They've run out of anything to say about themselves. All they can do is talk about us. I think a lot of Australians are aghast when they realise that the current government has only commissioned 10 days of parliament in eight months. Uh, the Senate under this government is only gonna sit for seven days. Imagine how many Australians returning to work this week after their month on holiday were to just say to their boss, listen, I've been thinking about it. I've decided I only want to come to work for 10 days and eight months. Good luck. They'll say you can stay away for the whole eight months, buddy. The fact of the matter is this is a government who has no legislative agenda. You know, 
Take, for instance, the issue of uh, the Murray-Darling Basin. Big issue. We're seeing fish kills in large and alarming numbers. It's an ecological disaster. Water, availability, it's quality. It's one of the key issues in Australia. You don't hear the government talking about that. They just worry about, is another member of the team going to quit today? Is another unhappy Liberal going to announce they're running as an independent? This government has nothing to say positively about the future of Australia. They can tell you everything about us, they can tell you everything about their own civil war, but they can't talk about the people of Australia. That's what's happening. On the seat of your wall, what do you make of the news that you Oh, well. Another Conservative running in Gilmore isn't going to change what happens in Gilmore. The real issues in Gilmore is the fact that everything's going up except people's wages. The real issues in Gilmore is that they haven't had sufficient investment in local infrastructure. The real issues in Gilmore are that we've seen hospital cuts, we've seen private health insurance become, with their price increases, practically become a luxury item. The real issues in Gilmore are that people who are very low paid lost their penalty rates arbitrarily. There are many issues in Gilmore, from NBN access and black spots through to uh, how we're going to properly fund our schools and preschools. Whoever is running for the coalition is not my issue. The issue for me is the cost of living and the daily lives of people in Gilmore. It does highlight, of course, the instability within the government. You've got nationals running against liberals. You've got ex-liberals running against liberals in safe seats. This government's a mess. And every day uh, we just see more chaos, more confusion, more instability. Any other questions? Thanks, everybody. I want to just thank the community here for the successful lobby for the Community Hub. This is your Renewable Energy com Community Power Hub. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so that was the opposition leader, Bill Shorten, there speaking in a beautiful little spot of Tarthra on the south coast of New South Wales. We're expecting the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to uh, start a speech within the next hour or so. It's his uh, first major economic speech of the year in this election year, and we'll bring that to you live here on the ABC News channel. And so the Prime Minister has put jobs at the heart of his pitch to voters, promising to create more than a million full-time positions over the next five years. He'll outline the pledge in Queensland today in that first major economic speech speech of the year. Political reporter Jane Norman has more from Parliament House in Canberra. You might remember that in the lead up to the 2013 election, Tony Abbott promised a coalition government would create a million jobs over five years. Well, last year the coalition reached that milestone, economists say largely because of population growth, but nonetheless Scott Morrison is effectively repeating that pledge but promising that under a coalition government 1.25 million jobs would be created over the next five years provided the coalition is re-elected. So he's giving this speech in Queensland today where the coalition is is worried about a number of seats it holds. I think there are about six seats that are marginal. So if there's a swing against the government, then they're very much at risk of losing those. Um, Mr Morrison will promise significant spending on what he's calling congestion-busting infrastructure in southeast Queensland. And he'll also make some pledges around um, reducing debt. But overall, Joe, this really is a speech about distilling the coalition's um, re-election pitch. It's all about jobs and the economy. Mr Morrison will... Um, will say that uh, the coalition will create a stronger economy, Labor, uh, under a Labor government there'd be a weaker economy, but he's not using the word recession. We have seen in uh, recent months uh, government front benches warning that a Labor government would risk, um, would, would Australia would risk falling into a recession. Um, Mr Morrison in this exchange with AM presenter Sabra Lane though wouldn't repeat that. It is a veiled warning of a recession. No, You've no, it's a front... direct warning. It's a direct warning of a weaker economy under Labor. Make no mistake. And why won't you, you say the word Labor, recession? If you, because I, I, I don't get into those terms. I'm a former economic minister. I'm a former treasurer. And I'm very careful about my language. And I don't want to – I want to be very careful about this. But I'm being very clear, Sabra. A vote for Labor is $200 billion in higher taxes on the economy, which will threaten jobs – and Jane, as we head towards the election, how is the government doing the polls? Yeah, well, the first news poll of the year is out today, Joe, and it shows that there's been a tiny bit of an improvement on the coalition side, but Labor is still very much ahead. If we look at some of the numbers published in The Australian, Labor's primary vote has actually fallen three points since December to 38%, and that would be a bit of a concern because the major parties like to see their primary vote in the 40s. Uh, the coalition has increased two points to 37%, but that movement is within the polls' margin of error. If we 
look at the parties on a two-party preferred basis after the distribution of preferences. Uh, the coalition's prospects have improved a bit since last year, but Labor is still ahead 53% to 47%, showing really that the government has not managed to recover the ground it lost after toppling uh, or after um, dumping Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister. And then if we look at the question of preferred Prime Minister, Scott Morrison is still ahead of Bill Shorten. So these movements are pretty small since last year when the last poll was taken. Um, it might provide a little bit of hope for the coalition, but they still have a lot of ground to make up to be in a really competitive position at the election. And still on federal politics, former New South Wales Minister Katrina Hodgkinson has confirmed her interest in running for the marginal seat of Gilmore in the federal election. She says she's been in talks with the National Party to enter a three-cornered contest to take on Liberal candidate Warren Mundine, who was parachuted into the seat by Prime Minister Scott Morrison last week. But it's all a bit up in the air at the moment. The National Party's still sorting out exactly what it's going to do. Katrina Hodgkinson joins us now in the studio. Katrina Hodgkinson, welcome. So it's all a bit of a mess for the coalition. Well, no, not really. I mean, the Nationals will consider which seats they're going to be nominating for. There's a due process that takes place and it's certainly not one that's reactionary uh, or measured against what other political parties may or may not be doing. So that process is currently underway and they'll be making an announcement on that when they're ready. But yes, I am very interested in nominating should the opportunity occur uh, for the electorate of Gilmore. It is an absolutely beautiful uh, electorate and one which I'm very attached to. Too. So I'm very much looking forward to hopefully having the opportunity, but of course whatever the Nationals end up deciding, I will abide by. But there are all sorts of allegations flying around at the moment. The, the state, uh, that the locals uh, put forward one person for the Liberals, uh, the state executive came in and overturned it. Uh, then there are locals who are tearing up their membership of the Liberal Party. It's a real mess in, in terms of that. Why, why do you want to go into that on the conservative side of politics when there is, yeah, there's so much vitriol going around locally? Well, other political parties will do what they do. They're a long way from what we do in the Nationals. We're very measured with the Nationals and um, the state executive will take their time and, and make the proper decision for the seat of Gilmore, and, as it will for all the seats around New South mm. Wales. The New South Wales Division will, will look after that. But what other political parties do and what other candidates do is I'll, I'll let them comment on that themselves. Yeah, so you're not going to offer a comment on how you, how, what you thought about the, the Feds coming in and taking over the, the locals uh, into, on the Liberal side of politics there? Well, if I'm given the opportunity to nominate, uh, to run for the seat of Gilmore, then my focus will be totally on the constituency, the people on the ground, the issues that matter, uh, and how people are feeling and what they want from mm. their local Member of Parliament. That will be my focus. I won't be focused on other candidates or other right. political parties. I've been a Member of Parliament in the past, and uh, that's always been my attitude towards now election, just get on with the job and do, do your best, put your best foot forward and let the others deal with themselves. So the Nationals seem to have been a bit hesitant about sorting this out, whether they're going to put up a candidate. Why is that, a, that the case? No, no, they just go through a process. And so there is a, a strict process that the Nationals go through, a procedure which involves the state executive of the New South Wales Division. They have their meeting dates set at a particular time and uh, they take a very measured approach. Yeah. And don't you risk splintering the Conservative vote if you put your hand up as well? Well, no, as I said a moment ago, I, I believe very much in looking after the local constituency for the electorate that I'm running in, and I'll be really focused on the voters and what the voters want to see achieved in the local area. And what's your personal connection to that area? Well, my husband was born in the area. I do have a place in, in the electorate of Gilmore in Nowra. I've got two properties within a short drive of the boundary, which are usually within the boundary of Gilmore itself. Um, I've got a lot of family in the area and as so well. And so will you be moving into the electorate yourself if you uh, win the, nom uh, the nomination? Well, I already have a, a place in Nowra, so so, which but is, will you, which is terrific. Will, and will you live there? Well, we, we also have another property at Berrimah and another property at Robertson, so we're between the three. You've got a fair few properties. <laughs> <laughs> All very close together within the stone story. Right. So, yeah. And so what are the what are the key issues in the electorate as far as you're concerned? Well, the main one is at the moment is certainly the Prince's Highway and we've just had a, another peak tourism season of course with the summer and people converging on the south coast from all over Australia. Um, so the population in some of the towns and villages goes up astronomically as I'm sure people would be aware. The Prince's Highway continues to be of great concern particularly 
intersections such as the Jervis Bay turnoff. I'm sure a lot of viewers this morning will have uh, experienced that turnoff just this, this holiday season. We've had too many fatalities on the Princes Highway. The state MPs, Gareth Ward, Shelley Hancock, Andrew Constance have done a fantastic job on improvements, but there's so much more to go. And I really do want to see much more Commonwealth involvement on solving the Princes Highway chaos mm. uh, in the way that it has done with the Pacific Highway. But so. the Conservatives have been in charge for quite a while now at the federal level. Shouldn't those things have been sorted out by now? Uh, look, a lot has happened with the Princess Highway. It's certainly made, had some significant improvements over the past several years, but there is much more to do. Now, the Nationals hold the roads and infrastructure portfolio in Canberra. That's held by our leader, Michael McCormick. So I'll be bringing Michael to the electorate and getting a commitment from him uh, before the election in relation to the Princess Highway. That's my aim. That's what I want to do. Obviously, there are a number of other significant issues facing the Gilmore electorate as well, uh, tourism facilities close to, to the coastal areas. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got jobs for the local area. Uh, there's a lot to do and I'm, I'm very, I've am very. i been enjoying getting around and about in the electorate and uh, I look forward to meeting as many people as possible. The Coalition seems to be struggling in the polls at the moment, ahead of the federal election, whenever that might be. Uh, what, what do you think of the, the state of the Coalition at the moment and what's happened with the leadership? Should Malcolm Turnbull have been dumped? Well, to quote John Howard, the only poll that matters is the one on election day. And we've certainly seen some turnarounds in the past. And John Howard was, of course, the master of that. Look, I've got great faith in Scott Morrison. I yeah. think he's a fantastic prime minister and uh, he has my full support. He's He's got great experience. And but has it just been doing. really ugly and really confusing for voters with, that, with uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull being dumped when he was? Look, I think that Scott Morrison is a sensible choice for Prime Minister. I really support him totally. He's got great experience as a Member of Parliament. I know him personally. Um, you know, he's the, the right man for the job, I think, the right person for the job. And uh, he's got a lot of common sense and practical experience. And he understands the person on the ground. So that's the sort of person that I'm happy to have in charge. Yep. OK, Katrina Hodgkinson, thanks so much for coming in and having a chat to us this morning. Great to be with you. Now, weeks after triggering voter backlash for sending out mass unsolicited text messages, Clive Palmer is again embroiled in controversy with the ABC revealing that an app produced by his United Australia Party has the capacity to track a user's location. The video game app called Humble Meme Merchant has been downloaded more than 30,000 times, according to its developer Tom West. Mr West told the ABC from Bali, where he's on holiday, that the tracking feature allowing it to identify users' locations and potentially access identity data was included by mistake. To summarise why it's there, it's essentially the leftover from a template, but in practice no data at all is being harvested. Mr West says he's releasing a new version of the app without the tracking feature and he'll release that within the next 24 hours or so. A spokesman for Clive Palmer says the party does not collect data on voters. The US Justice Department has announced...